In economics and in public choice theory, rent-seeking involves seeking to increase one's share of existing wealth without creating new wealth. Rent-seeking results in reduced economic efficiency through poor allocation of resources, reduced actual wealth creation, lost government revenue, increased income inequality, and national decline. Attempts at capture of regulatory agencies to gain a coercive monopoly can result in advantages for the rent seeker in the market while imposing disadvantages on competitors. The idea was originated by Gordon Tullock and the term was coined by Ann Kruger. Description The idea of rent seeking was developed by Gordon Tullock in 1967. The expression rent seeking was coined in 1974 by Ann Kruger. The word rent does not refer here to payment on a lease but stems instead from Adam Smith's division of incomes into profit, wage, and rent. The origin of the term refers to gaining control of land or other natural resources. Georgia's economic theory describes rent-seeking in terms of land rent, where the value of land largely comes from government infrastructure and services and the community in general, rather than from the actions of any given landowner, in their role as mere title holder. This role must be separated from the role of a property developer, which need not be the same person, and often is not. Rent-seeking is an attempt to obtain economic rent by manipulating the social or political environment in which economic activities occur, rather than by creating new wealth. Rent-seeking implies extraction of uncompensated value from others without making any contribution to productivity. The classic example of rent-seeking, according to Robert Schiller, is that of a feudal lord who installs a chain across a river that flows through his land and then hires a collector to charge passing boats a fee to lower the chain. There is nothing productive about the chain or the collector. The lord has made no improvements to the river and is helping nobody in any way, directly or indirectly, except to himself. All he is doing is finding a way to make money from something that used to be free. In many market-driven economies, much of the competition for rents is legal, regardless of harm it may do to an economy. However, some rent-seeking competition is illegal, such as bribery or corruption. Profit-seeking in this sense is the creation of wealth, while rent-seeking is the use of social institutions such as the power of government to redistribute wealth among different groups without creating new wealth. In a practical context, income obtained through rent-seeking may contribute to profits in the standard accounting sense of the word. Examples An example of rent-seeking in a modern economy is spending money on lobbying for government subsidies in order to be given wealth that has already been created, or to impose regulations on competitors in order to increase market share. A famous example of rent-seeking is the limiting of access to lucrative occupations, as by medieval guilds or modern state certifications and licenses. Taxi licensing is a commonly referenced example of rent-seeking, to the extent that the issuing of licenses constrains overall supply of taxi services, forbidding competition by livery vehicles. In regulated taxis in or illegal taxis renders the transaction of taxi service a forced transfer of part of the fee, from customers to taxi business proprietors. The concept of rent-seeking would also apply to corruption of bureaucrats who solicit an extract, bribe or rent for applying their legal but discretionary authority for awarding legitimate or illegitimate benefits to clients. For example, tax officials may take bribes for lessening the tax burden of the taxpayers. Regulatory capture is a related concept which refers to collusion between firms and the government agencies assigned to regulate them, which is seen as enabling extensive rent-seeking behavior, especially when the government agency must rely on the firms for knowledge about the market. Studies of rent-seeking focus on efforts to capture special monopoly privileges such as manipulating government regulation of free enterprise, competition, 
The term monopoly privilege rent-seeking is an often used label for this particular type of rent-seeking. Often cited examples include a lobby that seeks economic regulations such as tariff protection, quotas, subsidies, or extension of copyright law. And Kruger concludes that, empirical evidence suggests that, the value of rents associated with import licenses can be relatively large, and it has been shown that the welfare cost of quantitative restrictions equals that of their tariff equivalents plus the value of the rents. Economists such as the chair of British financial regulator the Financial Services Authority lauded Air Turner have argued that innovation in the financial industry is often a form of rent-seeking development of theory. The phenomenon of rent-seeking in connection with monopolies was first formally identified in 1967 by Gordon Tulloch. Recent studies have shown that the incentives for policymakers to engage in rent provision is conditional on the institutional incentives they face. With elected officials in stable high-income democracies the least likely to indulge in such activities vis-a-vis -vis entrenched bureaucrats and or their counterparts in young and quasi-democracies. Criticism critics of the concept point out that, in practice, there may be difficulties distinguishing between beneficial profit-seeking and detrimental rent-seeking. Often a further distinction is drawn between rents obtained legally through political power and the proceeds of private common law crimes such as fraud, embezzlement and theft. This viewpoint sees profit as obtained consensually through a mutually agreeable transaction between two entities and the proceeds of common law crime non-consensually, by force or fraud inflicted on one party by another. Rent, by contrast with these two, is obtained when the third party deprives one party of access to otherwise accessible transaction opportunities, making nominally consensual transactions a rent collection opportunity for the third party. The high profits of the illegal drug trade are considered rents by this definition, as they are neither legal profits nor the proceeds of common law crimes. People accused of rent-seeking typically argue that they are indeed creating new wealth by improving quality controls, guaranteeing that charlatans do not prey on a gullible public, and preventing bubbles. Possible Consequences from a theoretical standpoint, the moral hazard of rent-seeking can be considerable. If buying a favorable regulatory environment seems cheaper than building more efficient production, a firm may choose the former option, reaping incomes entirely unrelated to any contribution to total wealth or well-being. This results in a suboptimal allocation of resources, money spent on lobbyists and counter-lobbyists rather than on research and development, on improved business practices, on employee training, or on additional capital goods, which retards economic growth. Claims that a firm is rent-seeking therefore often accompany allegations of government corruption or the undue influence of special interests. Rent-seeking can prove costly to economic growth. High rent-seeking activity makes more rent-seeking attractive because of the natural and growing returns that one sees as a result of rent-seeking. Thus organizations value rent-seeking over productivity. In this case there are very high levels of rent-seeking with very low levels of output. Rent-seeking may grow the cost of economic growth because rent-seeking by the state can easily hurt innovation. Ultimately, public rent-seeking hurts the economy the most because innovation drives economic growth. Government agents may initiate rent-seeking, such agents soliciting bribes or other favors from the individuals or firms that stand to gain from having special economic privileges which opens up the possibility of exploitation of the consumer. It has been shown that rent-seeking by bureaucracy can push up the cost of production of public goods. It has also been shown that rent-seeking by tax officials may cause loss in revenue to the public exchequer. Nanker Olson traced the historic consequences of rent-seeking in the rise and decline of nations 
As the country becomes increasingly dominated by organized interest groups, it loses economic vitality and falls into decline. Olson argued that countries that have a collapse of the political regime and the interest groups that have coalesced around it can radically improve productivity and increase national income because they start with a clean slate in the aftermath of the collapse. An example of this is Japan after World War II. But new coalitions form over time, once again shackling society in order to redistribute wealth and income to themselves. However, social and technological changes have allowed new enterprises and groups to emerge in the past. A study by Laband and John Sophocleus in 1988 estimated that rent-seeking had decreased total income in the USA by 45%. Both Dugan and Tulloch affirm the difficulty of finding the cost of rent-seeking. Rent-seekers of government-provided benefits will in turn spend up to that amount of benefit in order to gain those benefits, in the absence of, for example, the collective action constraints highlighted by Olson. Similarly, taxpayers lobby for loopholes and will spend the value of those loopholes, again, to obtain those loopholes. The total of wastes from rent-seeking is then the total amount from the government provided benefits and instances of tax avoidance. Dugan says that the total rent-seeking costs equal the sum of aggregate current income plus the net deficit of the public sector. Mark Gradstein writes about rent-seeking in relation to public goods provision, and says that public goods are determined by rent-seeking or lobbying activities. But the question is whether private provision with free-riding incentives or public provision with rent-seeking incentives is more inefficient in its allocation. The economist Joseph Stieglitz has argued that rent-seeking contributes significantly to income inequality in the United States through lobbying for government policies that let the wealthy and powerful get income, not as a reward for creating wealth, but by grabbing a larger share of the wealth that would otherwise have been produced without their effort. Piketty, Sires and Stantcheather have analyzed international economies and their changes in tax rates to conclude that much of income inequality is a result of rent-seeking among wealthy taxpayers, and often is not. Rent-seeking is an attempt to obtain economic rent by manipulating the social or political environment in which economic activities occur, rather than by creating new wealth. Rent-seeking implies extraction of uncompensated value from others without making any contribution to productivity. The classic example of rent-seeking in economics and in public choice theory, rent-seeking involves seeking to increase one's share of existing wealth without creating new wealth. Rent-seeking results in reduced economic efficiency through poor allocation of resources, reduced actual wealth creation, lost government revenue, increased income inequality, and national decline. in 1967. The expression rent-seeking was coined in 1974 by Ann Kruger. The word rent does not refer here to payment on a lease but stems instead from Adam Smith's division of incomes into profit, wage, and rent. The origin of the term refers to gaining control of land or other natural resources. Georgia C. Klein. Attempts at capture of regulatory agencies to gain a coercive monopoly can result in advantages for the rent seeker in the market while imposing disadvantages on competitors. The idea was originated by Gordon Tulloch and the term was coined by Ann Kruger. Description the idea of rent-seeking was developed by Gordon Tull. Economic theory describes rent-seeking in terms of land rent, where the value of land largely comes from government infrastructure and services and the community in general, rather than from the actions of any given landowner, in their role as mere title holder. This role must be separated from the role of a property developer, which need not be the same person.